Thank you, Karen. Years ago, if you had stood on the street corner and watched the funeral procession, you would have been extremely impressed. You would have seen standing there with heads bowed and hats off and tears coming down the cheeks, the President of the United States, the cabinet, members of Congress, diplomats from foreign countries. It was a tremendous crowd and the casket was draped with old glory. And there was dignity and there was awe and there was respect. That had you not seen him, you would have thought that the President of the United States was in the casket. You say, who was this individual in the casket? I'll tell you his name in a moment. It was an individual who had served in the government across the ocean. He ended up in Tunis and was buried there in Tunisia where he died. And he was so loved and so revered here in this country that they disinterred his body and brought it back to the United States. And it was a magnificent funeral. The man's name was John Howard Payne. He's known because of one simple line that he wrote that said, and I quote, mid pleasure and palaces, though oft I may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Home ought to be the dearest place on earth. It's the nearest place to heaven, and should I say the nearest place to heaven ought to be the home. I want to put forth a, forth a thesis at the beginning of the message today, and that is this. I believe the most important place in the world today is the home. And I believe the most important person in the world today is the father. Here's why. As the West goes, so goes the world. As America goes, so goes the West. As the home goes, so goes America. And as the father goes, so goes the home. A friend of mine wrote years ago, he said, we have a weak nation because we have weak churches. And we have weak churches because we have weak families. And we have weak families because we have weak men. Today's message, the Holy Spirit is going to take it to every individual here, to every student, whether you be male or female, to every mom, to every wife. But make no mistake about it, men, my message today is going directly to you. I want to preach to men today. Because I'm preaching on the subject, building a legacy. In your notes, I begin with a box that says, no nation ever has, can, or ever will rise above the quality of its own. Just this past Friday, there was an article that was published by a couple of individuals, Burgess Owens and Jack Brewer, who are former National Football League players. Let me read to you because the title of it was America's Crisis is the Lack of Fathers. I quote, There is little doubt in that America is experience, experiencing an unprecedented fatherless crisis. Approximately 80% of single parent homes are led by single mothers, therefore leading to nearly 25% of our youth growing up without a father in the home. This staggering statistic has not only destroyed the nuclear family, but has devastated communities around the nation. For example, 85% of children and teens with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. And over 70% of all adolescent patients in drug and alcohol treatment centers originate from homes without fathers. 
Fatherless youths eventually become adults who without the structure of a two-parent household struggle to gain their footing in the world, there is little doubt that America is experiencing an unprecedented fatherless crisis. I've got my Bible open. This is uh, to the 128th Psalm. And before we put the verses on the screen, let, let me just say that Psalm 128, in my estimation, is a perfect portrait of the family and the home as God intended it to be. And as I said before, today, the focus of this message, men, is to you, the head of the home. Psalm 128, look at the first two verses. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy and it shall be well with you. You know, as you're reading that, the first, I mean, a presupposition right there is, who in the world is the you? Well, you get the clue when you get to verse number three. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like, the, like olive plants all around your table. Obviously, it's the father. Now listen very carefully. The reason why the psalmist begins with the father is because the father in God's plan is to be the head of the home. Listen, men, not a dominating dictator, but a loving leader. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. He said, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. You know what I've discovered in my lifetime? Anything without a head is dead, and anything with two heads is a freak show. <laughs> in your notes, I have one introductory statement, and that statement says this. The number one problem in America is that men have abdicated the place of leadership in their families. We've deserted. They've deserted their post, shirked their responsibilities of being the leader and the head in the home. Scholars have studied the decline of ancient civilizations like Greece and Rome. And I remember years ago as a student in the university that uh, reading this and they had found a pattern to be the same in every instance here it is, and there are seven of them that they found in all of the ancient civilizations. Number one, men cease to lead their families in worship. Number two, men selfishly neglect, neglected. This is how the progression until finally the nation was no longer a strong nation, and they, it disintegrated. Number one, men ceased. The first thing, men ceased to lead their families in worship. The next, men selfishly neglected care of their wives and children to pursue material wealth, political and military power, and cultural development. And that led to number three, men being preoccupied with business or war, being preoccupied with business or war, either neglected their wives sexually or became involved with lower class women or with homosexuality and a double standard of morality developed which led to number four, the role of the woman at home and with children lost value and status. Women being neglected and their roles being devalued, they revolted to gain access to material wealth and also freedom for sex outside of marriage. Laws regulating marriage made divorce easy, which led to number five, husbands and wives competed against each other for money, home, leadership, and the affection of their children, resulting in hostility, frustration, and possible homosexuality in the children. Many marriages ended in separation and divorce. Many children were unwanted, aborted, abandoned, molested, and undisciplined. The more undisciplined children became, the more social pressure there was not to have children. The breakdown of the home produced anarchy. 
which led to number six. Selfish individualism grew and was carried over into society, fragmenting into smaller and smaller group loyalties, the nation thus weakened by internal conflict. And finally, number seven, as unbelief in God became more complete and parental authority diminished, ethical and moral principles appeared affecting the economy and government, thus by internal weakness and fragmentation, the societies came apart. I put in your notes in that box, the Christian community faces current circumstances not confronted by our predecessors. We have this notion, if we don't watch it, men, that, that, that uh, what we are facing today uh, is the same thing that uh, our fathers or our grandfathers. No, 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 no. There is an onslaught today like never before. In 1989, in the city of Miami, there was a singing group entitled Two Live Crew. And they put a song out entitled As Nasty As They Want to Be. In that song there were 87 graphic references to perverted sex, 226 uses of the F word, and 117 descriptions of genital organs, and it sold over 2 million copies in 1989. And in 1990, it became the first album in history to be deemed legally obscene by the U.S. District Court, the Southern District court there in Florida, but it was overturned by the 11th Circuit Court. You see, the media has a target, men, and that's for our families. It's right there, and the bullseye right there is on us, because if they can get us, they're going to gain free entry. The devil's going to get free entry into the home. I always thought of myself as this, that... Uh, like the watchman, I stood at my family and I had to watch my life. I didn't want anything in my life to be such that it would give Satan free access into my home, into my marriage, into my kids' lives. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm just talking about like David with a man after God's own heart and wanting his family to be everything that God intended it to be. Have you ever thought that when you go to a movie or you turn on the, the TV or watch a uh, a, a movie, you download a movie that you're going into the battlefield. That's how it is today. <clears throat> Your mind is under siege, siege, and the moral values that you have are under assault. You see, in spiritual warfare, I've discovered that there are a few battles that are more absorbing and exhilarating, or should I say entertaining, at the same time. Let me give you an illustration that reveals the strategy of the media. <clears throat> 30 years ago, in 1992, there was a film that came out, starred Nick Nolte, entitled Cape Fear. The original film, it was a, it, it was a, uh, the original film was 30 years before that in 1962, but it had another director. Let me show you the difference. In 1962, the family was under attack by a villain. The father was noble. He struggled to defend his family. He headed his family. He was a good man. He was affectionate to his family. He was unselfish. He cared about others. His moral and ethical standards were very high. The 1992 version, the father was abusive and harsh and self-centered. In 1962, there was no reference whatsoever to the villain's religious values. But in 1992, the villain was depicted wearing a cross and being a religious fanatic. And the unfortunate thing is that we sometimes are, we get in a rat race. We're running so fast that it seems like we never have time for that which matters and ought to matter the most. Our families, our marriages, our children, we're tired, we're worn out. And we live constantly in a family, in a culture that teases us to buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even know or like. Dr. M.R. Dehan 
said this, and I quote, the nearest thing to heaven on earth is the Christian family and the home where husband and wife, parents and children live in love and peace together for the Lord and each other. The nearest thing to hell on earth is an ungodly home broken by sin and iniquity where parents bicker, quarrel, and separate, and children are abandoned to the devil and all the forces of wickedness. Basically today, what I just want to share are 10 principles that I have lived by as a father. Because men, we are building a legacy, whether we like it or not, good legacy or a bad legacy. And these are principles that have driven me and shaped me and as a result impacted my daughters and to whatever degree have shaped their families and marriages. And so I want to go through these 10 principles that I have lived by as a father, okay? And I didn't drum them up. They're from God's word. And I just said, Ken, you're going to do it yourself your way or are you going to do it God's way? And I decided, um, if anyone has to do repenting, it's me, it's not God. Okay, so I chose God. Here's the first one. Let's go. Number one, be a father that meditates. Be a father that meditates. Notice that I didn't say be a father that reads the Bible. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, a very familiar verse the Bible says that God said to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So you know how I read that? I just, I, I believe what I read. And if I want to have good success in my parenting, then I want to be a man that meditates. I want to be a father that meditates not just reads the Bible, but meditates. And you can't meditate unless you really memorize the Word of God. It's like, uh, it, it, I, I, you know, it, the only thing bad about having services on Sunday morning is that after the service is lunch, okay? And because I'm going to illustrate the Word, what the Word means there in Hebrew, it's like a cud-chewing animal, like a cow. A cow will chew that grass. Boom. And then he'll bring it back up and chew it some more. I mean, how many here would like to chew vomit, huh? Uh, yeah, but that's what the cow does like there. Well, not vomit, but it does. It comes back up and goes into the, uh, the other uh, part of the, the, the stomach right there. And that's what meditating is. It is just letting the word of God dwell in you richly. Richly. Psalm 119.11 says, your word I have hidden in my heart. Let me just pause here. Listen carefully, men. Ladies, this is, this is God's word. And God's, the Bible says, your word, God, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. We've all experienced sitting in a service, getting moved, walking out, and almost forgetting what we heard. At that time, you can't treat God. You don't want to be God's word like that. You want to be a man that meditates and hides God's word because the Bible says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. When I got saved, I made a vow. I didn't know it was a vow, but I, I did promise God, and it was a vow that everybody that I saw that I went to college with or high school with, I would tell when I meet them, met them that I had accepted Christ and my life had changed. In order to do that, you have to look at people. And I said, God, I just don't want those people. I want to see people the way that you see people. So you know what I did? I memorized what Jesus had to say about every person. In, in Mark chapter 8 and verse number 36, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And I memorized that and I kept meditating on that, meditating on meditating on that, to where when I look at an individual, I don't see someone that, you know, is, has hair or doesn't have hair. 
There's someone that, you know, roots for the wrong team or cheers for Michigan. I don't, I don't, I, it, not, not that kind of divisiveness uh, like that. But I look at people, why? Because what God's word had done, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Principle number two. Number one, be a man that meditates. Number two, connect life with truth. With your children, connect life with truth. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Set them apart. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Well, it was over 30 years ago. We were living uh, before we came uh, to, uh, to Northwest. And it was the beginning of the year. And I thought, okay, for the first uh, number of weeks, we're going to, uh, let's uh, memorize. And I told Deb and the girls, uh, they were obviously younger. And I said, uh, uh, we're going to memorize certain verses. And I just feel that we ought to, uh, not that it was a problem in our house, but I just thought it would be very good as we start the year and to, uh, to memorize verses that have to do with the way that we uh, speak, what we say, how we say it. And so I remember the first week we memorized Psalm 141.3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And so I explained, you can leave that up, I, I explain, you know, to the girls that uh, that's what we want to ask the Lord to do. We want to make sure that there's a guard, you know, over our mouth that we don't say and, you know, that that guard doesn't let anything get out that shouldn't be. Well, later on that week, uh, toward the end of the week, uh, Deb was getting terror ready. I don't know if it was for school or for church or what, whatever. She was just a little girl and Deb was fixing her hair and Tara was squirming or whatever and and Debbie, uh, uncharacteristically, uh, kind of lost her patience. And when you lose your patience, you tend to say something, and you say it a way that you don't normally say it. And so Debbie kind of was that with Tara, and Tara said, Mama, is your guard out to lunch? <laughs> Men, you want to connect life with truth. Because everything about life, the world is going to try to connect to it. And you want to connect it with truth. A couple other verses that we memorized, uh, Psalm, 1, Psalm 19, uh, 14. In fact, if you were to walk out to where I walk in, they put right there on the wall for me to see, because so often I will say this, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord my strength and my redeemer. And so we memorize that. And, and then so, Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. You want to connect life with truth with your children. And listen, when it comes to purity, men, you want to connect life with truth. Don't let the world teach your child about sex. Number three, third principle I've lived by as a father, and that is create an atmosphere of acceptance and unconditional love. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 1.16, to the praise of the glory of his grace, watch this, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. I didn't do a thing to be accepted. You're not accepted by God by your performance. You're accepted by God because you're in Christ. I put in that box in your notes, God loves you just the way you are. That is something that I wanted my girls to know, that God loved them, and I did too, just the way they were. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't want to change us. It means that they're unique. You want to impress upon your child that they're unique. Psalm 139, 14. I will praise, <laughs> look at that. I will praise you, for I am fearfully 
and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. You want your child to absolutely believe that you believe that they are unique. You want them to know that they have love from you that's unconditional. I told the girls when they were growing up, I said, if you wind up being the worst prostitute in the city of Columbus, I will still love you. Because my love for you is not based on how you live. My love for you is based on the fact that you're my child. Now, it, it may hurt our relationship, fellowship, but I want you to know that I don't care what happens. Your daddy's going to love you come hell or high water. You want to create in your home an atmosphere of acceptance that they don't have to live up to a performance level. They, you know, that, they, if, that, that you still love them whether they make an A or whether they make a C as long as they do their best. Number four, major on attitude, not actions. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. All I want to say about this is that unfortunately, a lot of parenting and men, we are prone to do this, is uh, we, we don't say a lot and then all of a sudden, the child does something and we jump all over them. Don't major on their actions, major on their attitude. Because every action happened because of an attitude that a child has. And so don't major, just major on attitude, not actions. Number five, emphasize character over career. In all of my years, over 40 plus years in ministry, I've got to tell you, I have heard way, way, way more fathers and mothers talk about the future career for their child and what they're working for. And I'm not minimizing that. I'm just saying what you emphasize with your child. And to hear this from a father for you to emphasize character more than career. You know, when you open the book of Daniel, if you, if you don't know any better and you read the fact that Daniel, you know, the Babylonian captivity and Daniel along with uh, the other individuals uh, were taken uh, to, to Babylon and, and under Nebuchadnezzar's rule, you think that, well, Daniel was probably a you know, 29-year-old man now, as best we can tell, he may have been around 13, 14 years of age. So at that, at that time in his life, that young time in his life, he was taken to a completely different culture, anti-God. Everything was against what he believed and what he had experienced up until that time. Daniel 1.8, the Bible says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. You see, when he was taken captive, up Nebuchadnezzar, man, I mean, I'm telling you, it was a, it was a spread. It, Nebuchadnezzar made sure that these, these young boys had a life of, uh, of luxury, uh, not, uh, not one of deprivation. The problem is this, that the food... Uh, the things that they want, wanted Daniel to do and the others to Daniel, it, it did not conform to the Mosaic law. I mean, the food had been prepared by Gentiles, which was against at that time the Mosaic law, and it had been offered to idols, which strictly uh, contradicted what uh, the Bible said in Exodus chapter 34, where they were forbidden to eat uh, flesh that had been... <clears throat> Sacrifice to pagan gods. And the wine, uh, they were forbidden to drink a, a, wine, a strong drink. Uh, oftentimes what they would do, uh, it, it, when, it, when Daniel grew up there in, in, uh, in Israel, is they would, uh, they would mix uh, 10 parts water with one part wine. They were forbidden to have strong drink, but the Babylonians did not dilute their wine. And so Daniel had purposed in his heart long before he got to Babylon that he would not defile himself 
And so here Daniel is, courageous, determined, and obedient to God. Now let me ask you a question. How did he get that way? He was just a young kid. It tells me something about his home, that his own emphasized character over career. Number six, contribute to making your home their favorite place to be. And the reason I said contribute is because, unfortunately, you know, when I was born and I grew up, the average man uh, thought this way. Well, I'll go out and, uh, you know, the, the wife will raise the kids and she'll set the pace there. I'll go out and I'll, I'll work and I'll, I'll be the bread earner and I'll bring it home. And so mom does all this other stuff and dad would come in and he would almost be a non-player in the family. Men, we must contribute to making our home their favorite place to be. Let me say two things here. Number one, affirm your child, affirm them. I, I, wanted, I wanted my daughters to have a can-do attitude. The glass would always be half full, not half empty, but I'm not talking about self. The Bible says, connect life with truth, men. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 13, I can do all. Say the word all. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So affirm them that whatever God wants them to do, they'll, they'll get it done. If God puts it on your heart, doesn't mean it won't be difficult, but you can get it done. Affirm your child. Affirm them. Every one of us have, been, have, have made mistakes or we... We failed at something, but we're not a failure because we failed. There's no failure except in no longer trying. So you just affirm the child. And number two, give them freedom. Give them freedom to ask or express anything. And I mean anything. I always felt this way. I'd rather my girls ask me or their mama than someone else. Something was on their heart, a question they had. I want them to feel like, first of all, this was their favorite place they want to be, but it was also a safe place where they could ask and they could get an answer. Never be condemned for what they asked. You don't want your child in your home to be like so many of us were maybe when we were in school, in grade school, and we were afraid to raise our hand because it, we might show our ignorance. You want your child to be able to express anything, have the freedom to ask or express anything. I remember the night uh, that uh, we got home from uh, Brooks um, rehearsal, a dinner. And uh, so I got up into uh, our bedroom suite and I looked in, I was at my desk and I looked in and Brooke's in the middle of the bed and Debbie's on one side and Tara's on the other and they're talking. And I just assumed they were talking about what a great man that uh, they had had the privilege of. <laughs> Don't tell me any different, okay? <laughs> no, no, but they were talking and, and it was, I mean, you know, it, it was her last night. Well, Deb and them, uh, a Deb and Tara took off, and Brooke was still in the bed, and I'll never forget she was like this. And so I went, and I got on the bed with her, and I said, honey, I said, does your head hurt? And she goes, no, daddy, my heart hurts. She goes, I can't wait till tomorrow to marry Jamie, to spend the rest of my life with him. But I know, as I look back, that it'll never quite be the same. And I have nothing but wonderful, fond memories of being in this home. Contribute, men. Be a player in making your home their favorite place to be. Number seven, don't divide between the secular and the sacred. Don't divide. 
Colossians 3.17. Look at this. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all. Say the word all. all. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Over in 1 Corinthians, it's not up on, on the screen, but Paul wrote, he said, whatever you eat or whatever you drink, now watch this, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to divide between the secular and the sacred because in the Christian life, watch this, it's not secular and sacred. It's all sacred. Whatever you do, a child, homework, you want to be able to teach them a principle about, about homework, that it's, that it's a sin to do less than your best. It's not a sin not to get an A. If they can get an A, but they get a B or a C, that's not good. But if you do your best, that's the most important thing. You know, I've got grandsons. My girls didn't play sports. Uh, Brooke did, well, Tara did one. I think she played one year basketball in, in elementary because I remember I was her assistant coach. And the, uh, the head coach wasn't there one day. And so I'm coaching. And I told Tara, I said, All right, not Tara. When the person comes down, that girl you, you, you're going to guard, she has a tendency to go this way. And so when you do, steal the ball and go in for a score. And she just looked at me. Because I just told her to steal something. <laughs> I forgot. I've, I'm, I'm done coaching my little girl, okay? <laughs> like, like that. But uh, you, you, wanna, you, want, you want to be, it's not secular and sacred all. You want to give your all. You want to, you want to, that, that everything we do, we're going to stand before the Lord someday and give an account. And we want to do it for his glory and for our good. Number eight, covenant with your children concerning their future spouse. Covenant with your children. I told Tara and Brooke when they were growing up, I said, I'll be the dad that God wants me to be. I'll guard and I'll protect you. And uh, you, uh, you can trust me. And you just, you love the Lord with everything. And I used the verse where, in fact, Debbie had it in the fly leaf of her Bible. Uh, shortly after we were married, still there. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I just told this to the girls. I said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Now watch this. In all your ways, acknowledge him. I said, Tara, that's your part. And he will direct your paths. That's God's part. And I told the girls, I said, listen, let's covenant together. I'll be the dad. You love Jesus with everything you've got. I'll be the father that protects you the father that guards you. You just, you grow up and you just be a, a young lady mighty in spirit. And the Bible says that I don't think you can miss it. Trust in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. I said, when God gets ready to bring the guy into your life, if, if, if you don't notice him, he'll, God will slap you upside the head. He'll let you know, here's the guy. I, I believed it. I absolutely believed it. It didn't come without any effort, but I believed God. And I said, you let me be the man in your life. Tara Brooke, you, you, you learn to love the Lord with all of your heart, everything you've got. You're gonna have some bumps along the way, but you, you learn to love him and he'll direct your path. He'll bring, and as a result, the Lord's blessed me with Bob and Jamie. Covenant with your child. I, I just have, if somebody wanted to date the girls, they had to come and see me. And how, how puritanical that is, huh? How ancient that is. Well, I use this great illustration. 
that the girls, quite frankly, got sick and tired of hearing this illustration. <laughs> but I said, now here, can you imagine, let, let me put it modern day. Could you imagine uh, if, uh, let, let's say my girls are teenagers and somebody wants to date my, my daughter and, and oftentimes today, a dad will just say, have a wonderful time and he never meets the guy that comes and takes his girl out. I said, do you think for a moment, girls, do you think for a moment if I, if I, brought, if I had purchased a brand new Lamborghini that can go anywhere from 200 up to over $300,000 today, have it sitting in my driveway and let some guy that I've never met, a teenager, come and take the car and just take it for the evening? There's no way that any of us guys would do that. And yet, oftentimes, a father will let his daughter go out with somebody he's never met. I just say, men, covenant with your children concerning their future spouse. A man says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do that with my son, but not with my daughter. I didn't have any son, but if I did son, I'd do it the same way. And be a player in your girls' lives. Let them see. And that which leads me to number nine, model authentic love between you and your wife. Let your children see. Let them see the real thing. Because if they get to see the real thing between you and your wife, then when they'll detect a counterfeit, They'll detect some guy that comes along if, they're, if it's a girl with, with ulterior motives. I wanted to give my children, my daughters, a healthy, wholesome view of a man's love for a woman. They had an imperfect dad. We all know that. But I wanted them to see what it was for a man to love a woman. Model authentic love. And I realized as I was putting this message together that it may mean for couples to get together sometime soon and not have it out, but lay it out. And maybe for some men to ask their wives to forgive them and some wives to ask their husband to forgive them. And maybe some parents, some dads to go to their child or children and say, you know, there's never been a moment when I didn't love you, but I haven't been the player in your life that I should, but I want you to know that from this day forward, you're more important than my career. You're more important than anything. My love for your mother is number one. Next in line in my life is my love for you, and I want to be everything that God wants me to be in your life. And then I would say, number 10, force yourself to count the cost of losing it all. I have, if you've been around here for any period of time, uh, you have probably heard me talk about in my office when my girls were growing up, I had pictures of them all around my office. And I would once a week take a different picture, go to a different location, sometimes stand, sometimes sit, watch this. And I would have that picture and look at Brooke and Tara. Sometimes their picture would be together, sometimes there'd be two pictures. And force myself to think, what would it be like if I had to go to those girls and tell them that I had been unfaithful to their mother? that I had let my life get so messed up. And in one moment, they would love me, but I would lose their respect. And there would be times that I got to tell you, I would tremble inside. It was almost like it was real, but I would force myself to count the cost. But let me tell you now, something else. You come into my office, you'll see pictures of my grandsons all over, along with my family. And you know what I do? Not just, not just count the cost, men, because there are a lot of guys that they're, they're going to be faithful to their wife. They're not going to cheat on her. They're not going to steal from the place that they work with. 
but they're not going to be a player in their child's life. Force yourself. Think. Because I'll tell you, for those of you that have children at home, that time gets shorter and shorter and shorter and the window until when that child gets on their own. I mean, I can't believe it. August the 1st, Boston will be 16 years of age. Wait till you have to pay that insurance, Jamie, on the car. You'll, you'll be real excited about that. I end your notes with this. One final appeal. I want every man to look up here, if you will. I'm thankful that I have a wife that doesn't run her mouth because she's got enough copy to really mess me up. I've not performed in perfection. But I think Deb will tell you that what I've preached on, I've lived. I've done my best. I'll stand before God and I won't have to ask, apologize. I won't have God say, hey, Ken, why in the world did you just give a half-hearted effort? Whatever I have done, I have given my best. And I say this, men, this final appeal, and I give it to you in your notes. Pour yourself into your child. Pour yourself into your child. Men, I can't tell you how many times I've counseled fathers who they provided for their kids so well. The nicest clothes, the nicest toys, the nicest education, gave them a car when they got a certain age and all this other stuff. I'm not saying that a kid doesn't like that. But a child will long for those things more and more and more and more and more when they don't get from their father what they naturally long for. And that is love and attention that spells the word time. I am reminded of the young man that took his life and left his father a note saying, you gave me everything to live with, Dad, but nothing to live for. James Boswell wrote the life of Samuel Johnson. And it was considered at the time the most famous single work of biographical art in the whole of literature. And what Boswell did is he, 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 he gleaned from Samuel Johnson what meant, and, and Samuel Johnson would talk about the times that he would go fishing with his father. How to put a fish on a hook, and, uh, and just things that, that he, he, he remembered about those times, he went fishing with his father. Boswell located his father's journal, wanting to see what his dad thought about those days when he took his son fishing. And Boswell found these words, quote, went fishing with my son, wasted a day. To the boy, it was everything. To the dad, he wasted a day. I'm having a picture, large, constructed the letters that will be 
when you first walk in our house. I'll share with you what will be on it. One day, when my children are grown, I hope they still come through the front door without knocking. I hope they head to the kitchen for a snack and slump on the sofa to watch TV. I hope they come in and feel the weight of adulthood leave them, for they are home. For my children, my door will forever be open. I don't think anybody questions how much I love this church. I've given over 30 years of my life and I've, like people I preach to every week, I've, I've given time and effort. I love Northwest. Blows me away that God is, what God has done over the years here. But I didn't say to Northwest till death do we part. But I did to Debbie. Men, your wife needs to know that she's number one in your life. And then Debbie said, I do. Brooke and Tara did not say that to me. They did not say, I choose Ken Harrell to be my father. God did. And God drum dropped in my lap as he dropped men, your child or children in your lap. And he said, I trust you. Be the best father you can be. You will spend more time away from your child than you will with your child. Work hard. Make the best of your career that you can make it. You're going to do stuff around the house, but make no, make no mistake about it. Your child must know that they are more precious to you than anything that money can buy or any career or any office that can be provided. I have looked soberly at these principles that I have lived by and shored up afresh and anew that to the day I draw my last breath, not just my children and not just my son-in-laws, but my grandsons will see in my life and see in their father's life and their mama's life what it means to be a father, a mother, to see a dad and a mama who truly love the Lord. Not so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Not an idiot, but a person whose life is continually being shaped to be the man, the woman, that God wants us to be. Father, I ask that you would take the message today. I have, uh, I've chosen, Lord, not to give an invitation publicly today. I believe you've prompted me not to do that. But I do pray that this message will not fall on deaf ears, that these notes will not just stick in the Bible of someone, but that we who are men, particularly the head of our homes, the leaders of our family, will not try to be someone else, but will just try to be the best one that we can be. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.